So first of all, we need to establish some definitions. First of all, before we talk about the inverse of a function, we need to talk about a function itself. Uh, now, kind of one of the fancier, more technical definitions of a function is that each element of the domain is paired with only one element of the range. Well, let's think about it. Domain describes our x values. The range describes our y values. So another way of phrasing that is that for every x, there is only one y value. For every x value, there's only one y value. And that translates into the vertical line test. Y'all been shown the vertical line test before, right? Yes? No? Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about? Okay, so say we have a function here. The vertical line test says that if you take a vertical line and you pass it across the function, it will only touch the graph of the function at one point at a time if it is indeed a function. So this passes the vertical line test. If we had something like this, uh, I don't know, let's say a circle, okay? A circle is not a function because at many of the points, the vertical line would be touching two points on the graph. It fails the vertical line test. So a circle is not a function because, for example, let's say we're talking about this x value right here. It has two y values. Okay, it has two y values. Uh, the first one is a function. At any x value, it has only one y value. Okay, just a couple of examples there. Alright, so what an inverse function does is it switches the domain and the range of a particular function. So I'm going to switch the x's and the y's. This is the notation for the inverse. It looks like a negative exponent. It is not. You read that f inverse of x, not f to the negative 1 of x. You cannot fix the negative exponent by moving it because it's not a negative exponent. That is inverse function notation. All right, let's look at two examples here. Um, of two functions. The first one is the absolute value of x. Now what this is, is, this is just a mapping of the x values to the y values. So the first word there is the x values, the second one is the y values. So if we plug negative 3 into our function, the absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. That's why there's a line drawn from negative 3 to positive 3. Well, with the absolute value of x, positive 3 also has the same y value. Okay, positive 3 also has the same y value. Same thing will happen with negative 2 and positive 2. They both map to positive 2. They both have y values of positive 2. So, every x only has one y. Every x only has one line or arrow coming out of it. So that means absolute value of x is a function but the y values there have multiple x values. Positive 1 comes from negative 1 and positive 1. So that means the inverse is not a function. Okay, absolute value of x is a function, but its inverse is not. The absolute value of x, if we think about it graphically, I'm just trying to show you multiple representations here. Absolute value of x is that v function. It passes the vertical line test, but if you think about it, um, if we switch the x and y values, the y values... Uh, have multiple x values. So that's why the inverse is not a function. This second example though, x plus 3, 
every x has only one y, and every y has only one x. So both g of x and g inverse of x are functions. We call that one to one. When a function and its inverse are both functions, then we describe that function as one to one. Absolute value of x is not one to one because multiple y's map to the same, uh, or excuse me, uh, multiple x's map to the same y. Uh, so absolute value of x is not one to one, but x plus three is. Okay, so those are just some concepts you need to be familiar with. Uh, let's look at these graphs right here and determine which one of these uh, have functions that are, excuse me, that have inverses that are functions. I'm getting my words mixed up. Which of these have inverses that are going to be functions? So graph number one, 2x plus 1, is its inverse going to be a function? Yes, okay, because we don't have any repeated y values there, okay? We do not have any repeated y values there. So graph one does, we're good. How about graph two? No, okay, we can look at positive four. There are two x values that map to positive four, or two. There are two x values that map to the same y, so... Uh, graph number two, that function, 1 over x squared, its inverse is not a function. How about graph three? No, same deal. Graph four? Mm, be careful. It's not symmetric like the other ones were, but there are multiple x values that have the same y value. Okay? So graph number one is the only function here that is one to one. It's the only one that's one to one. All of the other ones are not. Now, let's look at what part B there says. It says, for each function that does not have an inverse, see if you can describe a restricted or reduced domain so that the resulting function does have an inverse. What that's talking about is if we've got some symmetry going on, can we like cut this function in half, so to speak, still hit all the y values, but restrict it so that it does have an inverse. So let me show you what I'm talking about. On graph two, if we split that straight down the middle, okay, this graph, it's a mirror image of itself. It's uh, symmetric about the y-axis there. If we say that the domain of this is restricted to only positive x values, x is greater than zero, then we're ignoring the left side of this graph and it would then, its inverse would then be a function. Okay, its inverse would then be a function uh, if we ignore the left side of this graph. Could we do something similar to that, uh, like that to graph number three? Yes, where would it be? greater than or equal to 3. Okay, find that symmetry. It happens at 3, so that would be x is greater than or equal to 3. If we restrict the domain, we still get all the y values, but we're just excluding half the graph. Now, we cannot do the same thing to graph number 4 um, because it doesn't have that kind of symmetry. If we attempted to cut it down the middle, we would be missing the detail of this part of the graph, okay? We'd be missing the detail of that part of the graph. Um, so we cannot restrict the domain on number four to fix the problem. Um, now let me tell you of a new test that you can use to test and see if um, an inverse is going to be a function. The horizontal line test tells whether the inverse will be a function. Okay. 
Okay, so like with graph number two, if I put a horizontal line on here, it fails because it touches the graph in two places, unless I restrict the domain. Okay, same thing with graph number three. And you can put the horizontal line wherever you want to, really. You should move it along the graph, but it fails because it touches the, the function in two places. So the inverse will not be a function if it fails the horizontal line test. Just like the vertical line test, it's just the other way. Okay, so we're talking about inverses and whether or not they're functions or not. Well, let's find out uh, what their actual equations look like. So here's how we're going to do that. To find the inverse of a function, we are going to begin by switching x and y. We're going to solve the equation for y. And then we're going to replace y with the inverse notation at the very end. Okay, so this is why we did the warm up like we did. So if we've got to find the inverse here, g of x is equal to 3x. Well, remember, g of x is just a fancy way of saying y, okay? So we're looking at the equation y equals 3x. So to find the inverse, we are going to switch the x and the y. So we're looking at x is equal to 3y. How do we get y by itself? Divide by 3. Now, since we're trying to describe an inverse, at the very end, when y is by itself, we're going to replace the y with the inverse notation. So we started with g of x, so g inverse of x is equal to x over 3. Okay, so we get another one. h of x is equal to 3x plus 5. So to find the inverse, we switch x and y. So x is equal to 3y plus 5. Got an extra step here in solving for y. We need to start by subtracting the 5 and then dividing by 3. So h inverse of x is equal to x minus 5 over 3. Or you may see it written like this, 1 third x minus 5 thirds. Okay, all that is being done there is that uh, each term in the numerator is being put over the denominator. I forgot to do that on the first one. You may see x over 3 written as 1 third x. They're the same thing. They're equivalent to each other. You just need to be familiar with both forms. Okay, uh, y'all do j of x there. 